um, Josh Ahmed. Um, he is from uh, the University of Hull in the UK, and he's come today to talk a little bit more about his uh, work uh, as part of his uh, Leverhulme Fellowship, looking at, uh, well, the dynamic life and times of Oxbow Lakes. So for those of you who haven't at attended a Landscapes Live talk before, uh, Josh will talk for the next 30 to 45 minutes or so, depending upon uh, how long it goes on for. Uh, and then there'll be time for questions. So we do ask you not to post your questions uh, in the chat until uh, until Josh has uh, finished speaking. Uh, and uh, the session is then due to finish uh, in about 55 minutes. OK, so with that, I want to hand over to Josh. Josh, thank you very much for putting this together and, and being with us today. Cool. Thank you very much. You can hear me before I start talking and no one can hear me. Good. Perfect. OK, so, yeah, thanks to uh, the Landscape Lives crew for inviting me to do this talk. Um, it's kind of a, a very, very much a work in progress. Um, and this is ongoing research funded by the Levy Hume Trust uh, as part of a early career research fellowship that I started in mid-2022, so about a year and a half ago. Well, almost two years ago. That's scary. Um, looking at Oxbow Lakes and understanding more about their long-term evolution, in particular how they evolve physiochemically. Um, and this is kind of year one to the present of that research and then a bit of background as well that we'll go through and hopefully it will all come together. So Oxbow Lakes, why are they so exciting to me? Um, you can see they're very excited to me because I've put three exclamation marks on the on the slide there. But these things are iconic landscape features. They're found all over the world. A few examples here. Um, they're found in kind of polar cold landscapes like the Yukon River, loads of scroll bars and point bar. Um, deposits found in these floodplains and then oxbow lakes associated with those and meander cutoff um, occur through time. You've got the Mississippi River, so a more urbanized river system, um, but historically more freely moving. You can see from the, the great maps of Fisk and, and others um, how dynamic this river system was before the engineering kind of locked it more in place. And then the Murray River, so a more dryland. Uh, environment in Australia there, um, you get oxbow lakes across those landscapes, um, as well as on other planets. So you can see these things on Mars, um, you can see these lakes probably not formed through the same process, but on in different systems as well. So they're ubiquitous and really iconic landscape features. However, um, we don't really know a lot about what controls their evolution through time. We know kind of the basics, these things form through meander cutoff, which I'll come on to shortly, um, and they generally start to disappear into the landscape through time. But what we don't know is what happens in terms of their three dimensionality and what happens to their water chemistry as this evolution occurs through time. So why are they so significant? Um, a study from quite a while ago now, which probably has been updated um, noted that ecosystem services provided by riparian systems um, inclusive of oxbow lakes has a value of over three trillion us dollars um, and ecosystem services for those who aren't aware are kind of the goodness that the natural environment can provide um, back to society uh, to the economy and to people um, so, yeah, these are very valuable. The way they provide these ecosystem services are through things like nutrient filtering and contaminant filtering. Um, a lot of river systems have historically been home to mine, uh, mine acti mining activities. And this waste was dumped into the river system, still is in some places being dumped into river systems. And it typically adheres to um, fine grain particles, which are deposited over bank in these lakes during floods. So the lakes act as kind of natural filters for these um, contaminants and these nutrients to, to lock them away from, from the rest of the landscape. They also provide uh, specialist habitat for um, animals to kind of colonize in these lakes. These are ecotones, so specialist um, habitats that are on the border of terrestrial as well as aquatic landscapes. Um, so you get a, a host of uh, rich ecosystem services provided through that. 
and um what we don't really know about although they provide all these ecosystem services we don't really know much about the baseline conditions that actually support these ecosystem services and that's a real problem uh, for the future because climate change and human modification to landscapes is becoming more prevalent and we'll see uh, drastic changes in how the functionality of these systems occurs in the future and if we don't know how the baseline conditions function we won't be able to forecast how best to support these systems in the future so some of the work that i'm planning to do here and to discuss today is capturing those baseline conditions and understanding what controls the, those conditions from evolving so meander cutoff for those who aren't aware it's just a brief overview um, there's kind of two broad uh, mechanisms of meander cutoff, and these are shown in this panel here, so A and B. Uh, the top panel there is net cutoff, which is where this kind of classic meanders migrate into one another, and you get uh, the termination of the bend and the formation of this oxbow lake. Uh, but you can also get things called shoot cutoffs, which are more of a bypass of the um, the meander bend through floodplain uh, material. So it could be through depressions or it could be through um, just a headward cut. As, as floodwaters go over bank, then it starts cutting backwards and eventually breaks through and bypasses the bend because you've got a shorter, steeper pathway for that water to move through. And you end up with a shoot cutoff. Um, forms the same thing, Oxbow Lakes, but you get quite different characteristics of these lakes in terms of their um, their dimensions, their evolution through time, and the kind of sedimentary um, conditions within those lakes. And you see these things all over the landscapes I noted previously, um, and we're going to talk a bit about different types of cutoffs in the Amazon basin. So cutoff deposition, um, how these kind of bends evolve through time is controlled by a number of things, but we get differences between these shoots and necks, which causes them to um, kind of reduce in area and, and change through time. Deposition is controlled by a flow divergence as you meet the, the boundary. So if we just go back to the previous uh, bend or the illustration here, Net cutoffs tend to have large divergence angles. What I mean by that is the, the bend is the kind of angle between the new channel and the old channel is much larger. And therefore you kind of abstract little water into that former bend. So it kind of holds onto the water and doesn't take in a lot of material flow because the water's not going that way. Shoot cutoffs have tend to have shallower divergence angles and thereby water and sediment can still flow in there and they tend to fill up quickly through time and you get coarser sediments in there um, depositing further through the bend because the flow uh, can convey those sediments through the bend. And this is uh, this was illustrated by uh, Constantine et al. Um, shouts to Jose who was my PhD supervisor um, and got me onto this stuff in the first place um, but he kind of or they um, in earlier work kind of illustrated the, the importance of this divergence angle on sediment infilling and lake uh, evolution through time. So this terrestrialization process um, has typically been accepted as a, a long-term um, infilling process. So we accept that the, this is a time lapse through um, from 1994 to 2019 of a bend that was cut off. You can see it's connected 1994. It is terminated somewhere between 1994 and 95, and you get this deposition and rapid decrease in water surface area. And then, kind of 10 years later, you've got even more terrestrialization. You've got vegetation growth in there, minimal water inside the lake. And then in 2019, so a further 14 years after that, it's barely recognizable in the landscape you've got small areas of water um, but by and large it's totally disappeared and we can look at how these these bends evolve using a number of techniques um, Richards et al used um, some ADCP and multi-beam measurements to show um, this divergence and the, the flow moving away hence the, the infilling of the lake through time 
But if you look at these things um, on the satellite record through the through remote sensing imagery, the system isn't quite as simple as in filling through time um, to, until it disappears in the landscape. You actually notice that these lakes grow and shrink through time. So this is a, a SAR image on the on the uh, right here, which is um, radar essentially that can see through clouds. And then this is just a, an MNDWI image. So a, a modified water index image to pick out the water. You can see this lake on the left-hand side grows and shrinks down the, the tail or both tails of the, the lake, um, which is indicative of conditions changing through a seasonal cycle, through an annual cycle, and over interannual time scales, which begs the question: What's controlling those uh, changes in water surface area, or the, the kind of size of those lakes, and whatever's controlling it? What impact does that have on uh, the ecosystem services, broadly speaking, that occur in those lakes? So, the research questions that I propose to tackle um, and that I'll be speaking about today are how Oxbow Lake water surface areas vary with time and what the key mechanisms are controlling these changes. Uh, and I'll just caveat it to say this is currently being written up, so um, there's still a bit, it's still a bit raw around the edges, um, but hopefully it will make sense. So the study area that I'm um, really interested in is the Amazon Basin. The reason for that is just because rivers, particularly down in the southwest of the basin in Bolivia and Peru, are rivers on steroids. I like to think of it as um, these rivers evolve really quickly. You get tens of cutoffs forming. Um, so on this, the Beni River down here, um, there's about 38 cutoffs that have formed in the past 40 years. And there's 200 plus Oxbow Lakes sitting in the floodplain that you can still visibly see, uh, or at least in part see, that's still found um, that can be looked at through time. So there's three rivers that I'm looking at, the Memore, the Beni, and the Ukali, um, down in the Bolivian, Peruvian, Amazon Basin. And yeah, these have got huge numbers of cutoffs to study and active cutoffs that evolve, fill in and disappear on the time scale of uh, the remote sensing records so over 40 years on human time scales, which is just incredible to see that process. If you look at these systems in the UK, for example, things happen a lot more slowly. Um, I'm sure there's people on the call here who are uh, studying UK rivers and cutoffs that um, might take kind of tens to hundreds of years to actually cut off in the first place and then evolve after that. Um, so these things give us a, an insight into how they evolve and the processes controlling them. So the methods that have been employed for this study to look at how water surface areas change, the water surface area is simply the open water area of the lake. Um, we use a, a metric called the Modified Normalized Difference Water Index, which is quite a mouthful. Um, which is just a, a rationing of a multispectral image um, that we can obtain from Landsat, from Sentinel, um, and other providers, including drones, we can get now multispectral imagery. But here we're using Landsat imagery, um, and we can document how this water surface area changes by simply adjusting the image and picking out that water surface area through time. The other things we've been looking at are channel proximity, I'll come on to why that's important in a little while. And that's just using, again, remote sensing imagery, and looking at how, how the river changes uh, its position through time and how that um, relates to where the cutoff is. You can see here the former channel in the black outline with the, the current channel in blue. And then a gridded precipitation data set. So this is the eMERGE uh, tropical rainfall uh, satellite data set. Um, and this is at 10 kilometer resolution, so it's not super good um, if you wanted to find fine scale um, details of rainfall, but for the purpose of this study and kind of the scale we're looking at here, 10 kilometer points are um, fine for the job. And I'll say that a lot of this was done through Google Earth Engine processing, so using um, cloud-based operations to kind of minimize the local expense um, and processing time uh, and to kind of maximize the data sets that we're analyzing. 
So looking at water surface areas through time, as I alluded to earlier with that uh, GIF that was kind of showing the lakes growing and shrinking through time, this is a set of 20, no, 38 lakes from the, the Benny River. And each one of these lines represents a lake and how it's evolving in terms of its water surface area in kilometers squared through time. Um, the lines basically go from whenever the lake or the cutoff was formed and then end when it disappears from the, the image or it's not resolvable. So it might just be a resolution thing, but basically it's disappeared or uh, until the 2022. So kind of everything ends here if it still exists. And you can see quite clearly that things go up and down, up and down. Things do tail off quite rapidly, but there's a lot of lakes that stay relatively constant and kind of increase and decrease on annual time scales. The resolution that we're looking at each one of these lakes is one once per year around the dry season to get the kind of a conservative estimate of um, lake area. This is also chosen because cloud cover is minimized, um, which is a key thing if you want to use optical imagery to look at water surface areas, we need to have no clouds in the sky. So this is just using kind of one data point per year for each lake. And you can see that the lakes do evolve through time. Uh, I've just drawn a kind of example here on the, the right hand side to show uh, how these water surface areas are or how they appear on certain lakes. So this is one of the meander bends that's been cut off uh, cut off in 1992. So this beigey color represents the the lake as it was terminated. So really large, basically fills up the entire meander bend besides the, the plug at the, the entrance there. And then we move through time from 2000, which is the, the gray boundary, which you might be able to see. There's a black boundary here, 2010, which kind of shows this shrinking through time. And then in 2022, you've got the lake area which is more or less just the the most distal parts away from the channel with a smaller area here um remaining but the the kind of the take takeaway point from this is that these areas change and grow and and shrink through time i also did this for the memori river um this was done really recently so um again this figure's a little bit raw um, in terms of its colors but um, it demonstrates the point again, you get a lot of fluctuation. Um, some points tail off quite rapidly and then grow again, um, but you get yeah huge variation year on year. So water surface area evolution uh, varies between the types of cutoff or the, yeah, the type of lake that you've got in the floodplain. So what I thought would be really interesting is to see whether necks and shoots which are those two types of cutoff, um, I've just illustrated the top there just as a reminder, whether they change their surface areas on um, and, and kind of the average change is, is different between them. As you can see, they are different, um, maybe not statistically, kind of average is around the same point, but in terms of their variability and how much they change year on year, there's a, a lot more variability in shoots than there is in necks. And if you think about the mechanics behind that, shoots have a lot more connectivity to the, the channel um, since their divergence angle might be less or they might not be fully disconnected um, in the sense that necks get kind of plugged up quite quickly and their divergence is quite large. So you'll note that, yeah, you get a lot more variability in growth and shrinkage of these lakes year on year for the shoots than the necks. Um, maximum, just to explore that a little bit more deeply, the relative changes. So this is kind of fractional change from the year before. Um, if we look at those fractional changes year on year, the shoots demonstrate that, that large variability. Um, this is for the, the Memori River. This one's for the Benny. So that's why we've got different N numbers. Again, it's a similar trend. The necks have a lot less variability in terms of their annual changes than the shoots do, likely driven by that connectivity, um, which is something I'm currently putting together now um, to kind of explore more deeply. Gross water surface area changes. Um, I was wanted to see whether the shoots and necks had any particular um, changes through time 
that you could kind of document. There isn't a real change. The variability, as I explained already, is quite large on shoots, but the long-term change is more or less the same. You get kind of variability, uh, large changes uh, for either type of cutoff. The X's are necks and the, the filled circles are um, shoots. This X axis just represents the downstream distance um, as you're moving along the Benny River here. So um, we also want to investigate whether there was any differences um, in the position of the lakes. Maybe if you move downstream, you get more uh, water surface area changes because of more water being down there, but you see no variability. You can be downstream and have kind of more than 100% change in the, in the water surface area. Um, and you can also get that um, upstream as well. And uh, the, the variability is still, yeah, I know it doesn't really matter where you are along the reach. So one of the controls, if we think back to the controls on how these water surface areas might change, one of the obvious things is rainfall. So annual rainfall, if you've got more rain in a year, then you might expect the lake areas to grow more quickly. Rainfall obviously affects discharge. So if you've got higher rainfall, you'll have higher discharge and thereby maybe more ingress into the lakes. So what I've done here is just plot up the um, rainfall for or the total wet season rainfall. If you look at this first plot here, it's just a demonstration that you can use total annual rainfall or total seasonal um, rainfall. Um, they both, because the wet season basically delivers all the rainfall for the year, um, you can use either metric. So this is the total wet season rainfall. And you can see if you've got kind of low rainfall totals, you get a shotgun kind of plot here. You get to uh, relatively little water surface area change or you can get quite high ones. Likewise, if you have high wet season rainfall, you can get little in the way of lake water surface area changes, but you can also get high ones. So you, we can kind of derive or take away from this plot that rainfall isn't a key control. It certainly will play a role. And I'm currently plotting up some data to kind of tease out that, that um, understanding a bit more deeply. But in terms of a first order control, rainfall isn't um, a control on water surface area variations year on year. One thing to be noted about this plot, this is because the emerged data set is only runs from the last 20 or so years, the, the points here are only representative of yeah, 2000 to 2021 um, for the lakes. So there's another 20 years that's kind of missing in this data set, but I don't expect any um, drastic changes in the, in the result there. So channel proximity is the second key control um, that we can observe at least remotely uh, that might be playing a role in terms of uh, water surface area changes through time. Now here's a, a meander cutoff that we're just looking at at various time steps and you can see that as the channel kind of evolves around uh, and migrates across the floodplain it can go close to the lakes, it can move further away, it can migrate into the former lake and reconnect some of those um, those channels and kind of hydrologically motivate changes in those lakes. Uh, and as it moves further away, you expect less change to occur uh, or less kind of channel driven change to occur. So something we're, we're looking at currently is whether the proximity of the channel to the entrances of the lake are exert a, a considerable control on that water surface area changes. The early results show that there's a more or a stronger correlation between the position of the channel and the lake, um, simply because the hydrological connectivity is there, which enables the, the lakes to grow and shrink um, more easily than through rainfall driven um, water surface area changes, for example. So more data on that uh, soon. I was hoping to get it together for today, but unfortunately it's not um, not my day, shall we say. So to kind of explore this more deeply, there's only so much you can get from remote sensing data sets. And part of the fellowship was to go into the Amazon, to the Bolivian Amazon and to collect some data on 
the three dimensional changes in these these water surface areas through camera me measurements, through sensing technology, and through um, kind of field sampling techniques. So about a month ago, um, I was out in the Amazon with my colleague Josh here and Savannah. Um, I've got a shout out for the efforts they made on the trip um, to come and sample um, a kind of short notice um, a number of lakes in the Amazon. So the next part of the talk is just going to be some highlights from that and the data sets that we're kind of collecting from there and that we're hoping to build to then validate some of the remote sensing approaches I've documented previously and to gain a bit more insight into how that connectivity between river channel and lakes um, is a, an important aspect of the, the process. So this is an Oxbow Lake down in, on the Memore River in Bolivia. Um, what you can see here, I think is really striking, um, a really exciting kind of observation that you can't quite encapsulate from space. So you can see from space these water surface areas change through time. You see that the lakes are shrinking. I've documented some of that evidence already. Uh, they grow and shrink year on year. But here you can actually see the kind of tide lines as that lake is retreating and how it's changing um, across the year. So this was in October, which has been one of the driest Octobers on record, mainly driven by El Nino. Um, which in the Amazon drives a lot of the hydrology, particularly down, well, across the whole Amazon, really. Um, El Nino tends to make things drier. Uh, La Nina tends to bring more water um, and floods to the Amazon. Uh, and this, yeah, was towards the peak of the dry season. So the rain has started now. Um, it will start to replenish some of this lake water surface area. But you can see that it's retreated from the kind of area that was up here down to here, down to here, and then the, the current water extent during the, the picture, the kind of apex of that, that point was down here. And this growth and shrinkage of the water will influence the chemistry of that water because you're either concentrating or diluting the conditions within the lake. You're changing the depth uh, profile, which means you're affecting temperature, um, salinity and habitat creation through all that, um, all those changes. So we went into four of these lakes to examine how the, the chemistry might be changing um, and to kind of gauge what, what we're working with in terms of um, lake areas. So as I said, um, looking at the Rio Memore, these are the, the four lakes that I, or that we went and explored, um, mainly around the central to northern part of the river um, where there's countless oxbow lakes. Let's stop scrolling through there. Um, and yeah, these are lakes of varying connectivity. So one of the key questions related to that proximity of the river channel is if the lake is connected to the channel, does it have more influence on, or does it have more mixing and more changing in chemistry because you're getting the influxes from the river channel? If you're less connected and more remote in the floodplain, it's only so remote you can go, unfortunately, um, when you're trekking through jungle and trying to get through the uh, boats and stuff into these lakes. But this is, for all intents and purposes, disconnected from the river channel, whether this has a different signature to a river that's, uh, to a lake that's still connected to the channel. So we went into the lake and took a number of depth profiles um, looking at various physiochemical parameters. So one of the challenges we had on this trip was um, the core piece of equipment that would have measured all the, the multi-parameter probe didn't get to Bolivia on time. So we were returning before it actually got to the airport. Um, so unfortunately, we had to use a, a kind of lower spec sensor. This is just a HANA probe that was limited in terms of its depth. So we can only go down to about two, two and a half meters because of the cable restriction. But uh, regardless, we took a load of measurements around this lake to see how um, the kind of profile changed with distance. During the dry season, the expectation is that the lake should be more or less homogenous. Um, you've got no real mixing there because there's no flows coming in. There's no rainfall. Um, 
so kind of there's stagnation almost um so you can either expect a distinct layer a layering of the water body or a kind of homogenous um mix of stuff because the there's no ingress from any external water bodies the mixing during the wet season actually occurs in this shaded zone here so we took a prof we took profiles all the way around to see whether there's any difference during the dry season and then we'll be returning in the wet season to see if there's a, a particular gradient in those water chemistry uh, and water water physiochemistry um, conditions as you move around the lake um, some of the early data very early data um, is plotted up here on the, the left hand side uh, right hand side i'll just look at those in more depth here so what we've got here is on the y-axis is always the indicative depth i've used the term indicative depth because we're limited in uh, the depth that we could actually get to so the profiles were kind of varied um, in terms of how deep they were they were more relative um, to the depth at the cross section so this is yeah very much an indicative depth but generally um, you see these these trends in temperature dissolved oxygen and tds or dissolved solids um that kind of vary with depth there's no distinct pattern the different colors here are just the different profiles as you're moving around the bend so the greener the bluey they get the closer to that mixing zone and the the hotter the color the further away from that mixing zone um so more around a through f and then g to l is more bluey in color we see the temperature tend to decrease with depth, um, which is what you'd expect. You get a bit of confusion around here because, because of that relative depth profile. Some of it's not as deep as the indicative depth is, is stating. Um, likewise, for dissolved oxygen, um, the deeper you go, you kind of get, um, well, you get less oxygen dissolved in the water column, but there's also that kind of confusion in this middle zone because you've um the depths might not be too bad and there could still be some mixing in that upper surface which may have been influenced by um boat travel as well which can easily um disturb the water column and kind of increase that dissolved oxygen that's registered on the sensor and then dissolved solids is kind of a mixed bag um you've got kind of quite high in some places uh, this is particularly around that mixing zone um, during the wet season which is quite interesting um, but you've also got kind of a lower range you've got almost the full range across the entire area that we surveyed um, we were limited in the depth that we could explore so going back in the wet season and then again in the dry season with the, um, the multi-parameter probe that goes down to 20 meters depth um, for reference these lakes get up to uh, 10 to 15 meters de uh, deep during the wet season were around 10 well five to ten meters deep um in the well while we're there in the dry season so this isn't uh by any means a full depth profile it's very much an early indicative um measurements of those lake physiochemistry characteristics so other things we we're doing to quantify this change on the ground kind of calibrate the remote sensing data or validate some of those measurements is um getting out and hopefully this video will work and getting into the lakes to then deploy buoys. So this is a um, just a buoy with a turbidity, uh, t turbidity temperature and depth sensor on there, which will just record through time every 15 minutes what the water's doing. Um, we're really excited to see what that's going to pick out when the, the mixing occurs between the main stem and the, the lake because that will help us um, understand kind of what's coming into the lake and in what quantities. And then we can go in with the multi-parameter probe and, and help tease out some of that information. We've also got water level loggers in there to get a, a third dimension on those water surface area changes. Really intrigued to see what those will show. Um, as I already said, these things can grow by 10 meters compared to what they are in the pictures here, which means there could be all sorts of change in terms of physiochemistry but also for um, kind of deposition and um, 
sediment transport and, and um, physical kind of processes as well. There are a number of challenges with going out during the, the dry season. Um, and that these are kind of encapsulated in these images here. So trying to get into the lakes that were disconnected, we had to physically take a, a boat up the 10 meter high riverbank, get it through the rainforest and then into the lake. In some of the lakes with these tide channels um, that usually have no problem getting into the lake. So this is the lake I showed earlier where you can see that retreating water surface area. Um, and the plan was to go through this Thai channel to get there. Unfortunately, there was a, a landslide around here, which just threw a load of logs in the river, which made it totally impossible to get into the channel. Um, so there's a number of challenges in terms of actually collecting the data during this um, extreme kind of low water level. But we still managed to get some of the sensors out there and some preliminary data that we can help supplement during the wet season. And then, yeah, that's basically where I'm going to leave it for this uh, this presentation. But the future is kind of getting some further measurements during the wet season, getting another dry season, um, full kind of survey done with um, the multi-parameter probe, and then comparing what those wet and dry system uh, dry season characteristics look like to understand how the river is interacting with those lakes, how it's changing the uh, chemical characteristics of the lakes, and then what impact that might have on wildlife and communities around the lakes, and thinking about how those changes um, that are being imposed by landscape modification, so conversion to agricultural land, the installation of dams, which is quite high on the agenda in um, South America at the minute, and um how kind of those yeah that changing of the hydrograph through climate change and those human modifications might influence those mixing patterns and change the characteristics going forward into the future um yeah so i'll leave it there thanks very much um, thank you very much, Josh. That was a really, really interesting talk. It's really cool to see what you've been up to over the last couple of years. Um, so I just wanted to, again, um, say that please post any of the questions that you have for Josh um, in the chat and we'll get to those um, as and when they come. But I have an initial question, if that's OK, Josh, uh, to get us started. Um, so I, I sort of I like the fact that you went back into the field, perhaps to, to corroborate some of the kind of um, the data then that you gathered um, about kind of the dimensions of of some of these uh, stretches of the river. I'm just wondering, like, you know, there's sort of questions about what, how you define the channel width and at what point, you know, where do you end up um, actually on the riverbank uh, versus, you know, and I just wondered sort of, did you notice there was a difference then between sort of your channel width measurements that you make uh, remotely um, versus when you actually go in the field, how do you determine where that actual bank or the, the sort of the margins of your river actually are um yeah yeah it's an interesting question um you see lots of approaches particularly in remote sensing data because the resolution is kind of key to getting any of that information you kind of see in the, the picture here you've got a good 10 plus meters of slumped material along the banks or well, along the outer banks particularly which on a 30 meter resolution Landsat image, you might get down to 15 meters. You kind of miss that out. So you're always going to be about a pixel out um, on imagery like that. Um, I tend to use, to try and mitigate against that, I try and use things like the um, NDVI index to find more or less the bank vegetation line um, with the under, well, with the assumption that the vegetation, if it's being uh, inundated all the time will be either torn away or it's not going to get a chance to establish itself as well as you'd expect. So that's a relatively good measure for it. But you certainly do see a discrepancy, I'd say, between what you're kind of measuring in the field and what you can derive from satellite imagery or from DEMs. And it's all resolution based, I suppose. <clears throat> OK, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other questions from the floor? If you, you can raise your hand as well if you want, and you can um, uh, uh, activate your microphone if you'd rather do that than post a question. I can go ahead with the question if there's no one's. 
Um, I was wondering if what your hypothesis might be for how the dissolved oxygen and temperature might change. Um, is the, I'm wondering whether you things like algal blooms, if you get them in Oxbow Lakes, can you see that from satellites? Yeah. What, what's the kind of relationship there? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question. I am planning, so we've got on the multi-parameter sensor, there's a total algae sensor that we'll be taking out to see whether you can detect it or measure it in the field, shall I say. Um, there are techniques for extracting it from satellite imagery. Um, Sentinel has the capability to do it. We also have um, a drone that we'll be taking out. If I can work out how to get batteries from the UK to South America without getting arrested. Um, but that, again, using the band rationing procedures, we can pick out the information about those algal blooms and then how that relates to things like DO, whether you get certain times of the year that it depletes rapidly because you're getting so much kind of activity in those lakes or whether, and my assumption would be that after the wet season, that ingress of all that water and stuff, the soup that's going into those lakes, you're getting a, a huge boost in productivity that then influences DO, um, maybe increases um, carbon and kind of the, yeah, that profile. It'll be really interesting to see how that moves laterally as well as vertically through the system. Um, so we'll be hopefully able to capture that in a few months time. And then I can report back to you what it looks like. Any other questions? Aditi, did you? Oh, yeah, I can. Yeah, I was just like waiting if there were questions in the chat. Um, but I had a question about like, I think it was uh, some of your beginning slides about uh, water surface area and the difference that you see between the neck and the shoots. And there's, there's a higher variability in the shoots, um, but also like the number of observations on the shoots are lower compared to the neck. So is yeah. that how much of that variability comes because of the observations versus um... yeah it's it's annoying because they're on most of these systems there's they're dominated by net cutoffs so in these two plots here you can see that there's yeah double plus um necks so maybe that variability is down to just the number of observations i'm trying to think of ways to kind of mitigate against that um i might have a an idea about it but we'll wait and see so they might just be down to that i'm trying to kind of validate whether you get any particular changes or you can kind of detect mechanistically if there's a difference between the two things but it's quite hard to tease out and it, it's again a resolution issue um to try and yeah pick out this information at such a high res but yeah it's a good question good point and the, uh, yeah, the short is, I don't know, could be number of ob observations or it could be a legitimate difference. There certainly seems to be a difference in the, the way mechanistically they function. You'd expect there to be differences. And I think that proximity analysis that I'm doing to the, the river channel will tease it out a little bit better because if the, the shoots are all closer to or have more connectivity with the channel, you'd expect those water surface areas to kind of grow and shrink more responsively to, to how the river's functioning rather than the the more disconnected lakes. <clears throat> um, okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, well, we haven't got any questions in the chat uh, as as yet. Um, I'll maybe ask one more question and if we haven't got any others, then then we'll um, kind of bring this session to a close. Um, I just have a, a, a simple question just about sort of his the sort of historical time scales and I, I realize that sometimes it's difficult for certain areas um that people work in but um are there, are there any um historical imagery images that you've been able to access potentially that can kind of give you an idea about what maybe has been going on you know earlier I don't know I can't remember how early you said is it 2000 I can't remember uh forgive me but yeah what, are there some sort of longer term uh images that you could potentially use to sort of track that longer term evolution rather than just over the last couple of decades or so yeah so there certainly are archives in South America that have and even kind of Landsat have these kind of one-off images from the 60s. Um, I've not really explored how deep the record goes. 
Um, for the most part, I've just worked from 80s to now. And then the annoying thing is with adv advances in technology, kind of the, the better imagery is now, you know, 2015 onwards or 2018 onwards. So the stuff that you can really tease out with the more modern imagery um, or modern kind of map mapping technology um, just won't, it's not detailed enough to pick out the information that I need from that far in the past. There's certainly maps that will show locations of lakes and river channels. Um, and I'm hoping to, to get access to some of those to see, yeah, that longer term. I'm not sure how longer term it's going to be, but longer at least. <clears throat> Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much. So um, I just want to maybe thank you. Thank you again, Josh. I really appreciate uh, the time and the care you've taken with your presentation. It was a really nice one. It looked very, looked very nice as well, which is, which is half the battle, That's I good. think. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for everyone for being here. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll bring this session to a close. Thanks. Stop the recording now.